1971, Jethro Tull released their landmark album, Aqualung. The album became a major turning point for the band, kicking off a long career of critical and commercial success for the group. From the physicality of the title track's opening riff to the cerebral musings on religion and society, Aqualung charted its own path in rock history. Hello there, it's Warren Hewitt here. Hope you're doing marvelously well. Welcome back to another episode of the series. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And of course, if you hit that notification bell, you'll be notified when we have a new video. And if you're into production, you can go to producelikeapro.com and sign up for the email list and get a whole bunch of free goodies. Jeff Rotel was formed in 1967 in Blackpool, a seaside town in Lancashire, England. The band had a varied lineup over the years, including its earliest iterations. Singer and flautist Ian Anderson has been the consistent figure throughout all of these changes, as well as its primary songwriter. The band began playing London clubs as a blues-based band, which you can hear in their first album, This Was, in 1968. Quickly after, however, the band started to embrace new influences, wanting to expand beyond their blues roots. Anderson has said that the title was appropriate for that album contained music that the band had already begun to move away from for the next album, Stand Up. Yes, the, the, the music of Stand Up was indeed quite different and it, um, it wasn't abandoning what I had learnt in the first few months playing in a not particularly good or authentic blues band, but nonetheless a, a group of quite committed and energetic musicians. So it was just moving on to the next, the next stage and trying to bring other, other elements in, which were the things that were occurring to me that I wanted to write about. And so indeed, it was, a, it was quite a major step. And I, and for, I always think of the stand-up album really being the first real Jethro Tull album on a, on a creative level. You know, the, this, this was, was a, a toe in the water. It was uh, just getting noticed and, and I suppose putting on record, as the title suggested, this was Jethro Tull. This was how we began. This, is, this was the music we played at the Marquee Club in 68 and at the Sunbury Jazz and Blues Festival. But Stand Up was, was literally the, the emergence of a, of a broader based and more eclectic Jethro Tull, which is more or less what we've remained to this day. Aqualung, however, would take the innovations of stand-up to a whole new level, especially showcasing Anderson's now iconic flute playing. Like many of his peers in the 1960s, Anderson first picked up the guitar, imagining himself the next great guitar hero. However, when he started to hear players like Eric Clapton and Jimmy Page, he wanted to find something to set himself apart. He said, I didn't want to just be another third-rate guitar player who sounded like a bunch of other third-rate guitar players. I wanted to do something that was a bit more idiosyncratic, hence the switch to another instrument. When Jethro Tull began, I think I'd been playing the flute for about two weeks. It was a quick learning curve. Literally, every night I walked on stage was a flute lesson. Completely self-taught, Anderson based his playing on the same blues scale he would have used on the guitar, but with the intense breathiness of his overblown flute playing. Having some experience with the tin whistle before the flute, he applied some of those ideas to his new instrument. And I would chirp and burst the notes out to give them a bit more viciousness. And, and, I, and I learned that strangely, not from any other flute player, but from the tin whistle, because you could you could trill into a tin whistle and make it really penetrating, rather like a bird whistle, you know, like a pea in an old-fashioned whistle. Um, and the saxophone you could growl into. I, I knew because there was a saxophone player in one of our bands in Blackpool, and, and he would sometimes, you know, he could growl into the mouthpiece when he blew, and, and so I emulated that thing of, rather than play a pure note, I got and make it aggressive. So. I was certainly not the best flute player in town. I was the loudest flute player in okay. town. That was my sole credential when we started uh, 
at the Marquee Club and, and it got noticed. But I was essentially just playing the blue scale. I mean, it was just, just that. By the time the band started recording Aqualung in 1970, Anderson had started to really get a hold of the instrument, having played it for two years in the recording studio and on the road. In many ways, the flute bridges the gap between the acoustic, folk-influenced tracks on the album and the harder rock. Anderson's idiosyncratic flute playing merged these two worlds, creating a unified album out of some admittedly very different sounding tracks. Listen to how the flute begins a folky, almost haunting sound to the opening of the hard rocking track of Cross-Eyed Mary. As one of the only rock bands to have a lead flute player, Jethro Tull's sound is always their own. Even after Aqualung, Jethro Tull continued to be known for their eclectic influences and have worked in a number of genres. But Anderson's flute playing and instantly recognizable voice have served as unifying elements, creating a style that is always undeniably Tull. Anderson has said despite some of the hard rock exterior, for him, the album was like a singer-songwriter album. It's an album really that I think from my perspective, I think of it as being a singer-songwriter album with attitude. Uh, a lot of the songs were written with an acoustic guitar sitting in a hotel room somewhere on a US tour in 1969 or 70. And, and some of them were left that way. You know, the, uh, they, they were recorded by me alone in the studio and then we overdubbed some bits to them here and there. But then there were the rock songs that were that became more fully arranged rock tracks like Locomotive Breath and the title track Aqualung. But again, they were written with an acoustic guitar and then sort of embellished and relearned in rehearsal or in the studio to make them band pieces. Listeners have often referred to Aqualung as a concept album, a designation which the band has repeatedly denied. In a 2005 interview, Anderson explained, I always said at the time that this is not a concept album. This is just an album of varied songs, of varied instrumentation and intensity, in which three or four are kind of a keynote pieces for the album, but it doesn't make it a concept album. However, there are some clear themes, especially running through the second half of the album, which deals with topics related to organized religion and spirituality. Tracks like My God, Him 43, and Wind Up explicitly tackle church topics. As Anderson explains about the second side of the album, My God, the first track, isn't a song against God or against the idea of God, but it is against gods and the hypocritical church of the establishment. It is a criticism of the God they choose to worship. All three of these tracks take acoustic self-reflection and couple it with hard rock aggressive edge. My God even breaks into a flute solo over a section of vocal chant, imitating the chant tradition of the church. The mix is especially interesting on Wind Up, which begins with a short piano vamp followed by Anderson's dry vocals, accompanied only by sparse strumming on an acoustic guitar. As the song progresses, the track adds depth along with instrumentation. Martin Barre's guitar and Clive Bunker's heavy drums build alongside the intensity of Anderson's voice. Interestingly, the lyrics simply repeat what Anderson has previously sung so that the intensity of the critique of religious establishments comes through his particular performance, rather than the change in the lyrics. At the end of the six minute long track, the entire texture suddenly pulls back, and the song finishes again with single strums on an acoustic guitar and Anderson's voice. The constant change in texture and depth is striking, and it adds to the poignancy of the song's critique. Other tracks on the second side are less explicitly dealing with religion, but still seem to have a spiritual element to them. Songs like Slipstream and Locomotive Breath take a very philosophical outlook on life, 
with several references to God or the Bible. Locomotive Breath was the biggest hit from the album's second side. It also takes a philosophical outlook on life. Anderson uses classic blue train imagery to write a song about the concerns of overpopulation. Anderson explained, It was my first song that was perhaps on a topic that would be a little more appropriate to today's world. It was about the runaway train of population growth and capitalism. It was based on those sorts of unstoppable ideas. We're on this crazy train. We can't get off it. Where is it going? When I wrote it, I wasn't deliberately setting out to write a piece of music on a particular subject, but it evolved during the writing process into being not terribly specific, but about the issues of overcrowding the rather claustrophobic feel of a lot of people in a limited space, and the idea of the incessant, unstoppable locomotive being a metaphor for seemingly the unstoppable population expansion on planet Earth. The song begins with John Evans playing an expressive, jazzy piano introduction. Martin Barre's guitar enters to create a bluesy duet with Evans lasting a full minute and 20 seconds before the track breaks into the full band, and the train heads off the rails. Jeffrey Hammond's bass and Clive Bunker's drums drive the whole thing forward. Anderson's flute solo in the middle brings another layer of maniacal chaos to the sound of a runaway train. Despite the way locomotive breath masterfully brings together all of these individual pieces, the band struggle to find their groove playing it together in the studio. Anderson told Rolling Stone, Locomotive Breath was actually an utter failure when we tried to play it all together. It didn't gel. We didn't get the groove. Once they pieced it together in the studio and discovered how they wanted it to sound, it became one of their most iconic tracks. It was released as a single several times, although it didn't chart on its initial release in 1971, but in 1976 it made it to the charts in both the US and Canada and remains a favorite to this day. While the album's B-side seems to have a running theme of religious and philosophical musings, the A-side is undeniably grounded in reality. On the one hand, you have these softer, introspective tracks like Cheap Day Return or Wandering Aloud, and on the other, you have hard-rocking songs like Aqualung and Cross-Eyed Mary. The title of Cheap Day Return refers to an inexpensive single day ticket in which you depart and return on the same day. In this acoustic, thoughtful song, Anderson sings about the experience of waiting for the return train home and reflecting on his visit with his ailing father. He sings, and then you sadly wonder, does the nurse treat your old man the way she should? Similarly, Wandering Aloud is another acoustic track in which the singer reflects on his life. The lyrics detail a day in the life of a couple and wondering if the years will ever treat them well. Mother Goose is another particularly interesting track for the way it plays with acoustic instrumentation alongside its fanciful lyrics. The track uses recorders, similarly to another famous 1971 track, Led Zeppelin's Stairway to Heaven. While both of these bands had a heavy rock side, England was in the midst of an electric folk music revival, and bands like Jethro Tull and Led Zeppelin found themselves interested in the sounds of groups like Steel Eye Span or Fairport Convention. To understand how popular this electric folk rock sound was, keep in mind that Fairport Convention's 1969 album, Liege and Leaf, hit number 17 on the UK album charts. The songs were mainly electric rock arrangements of traditional folk tunes. When Jethro Tull picks up recorders, they're exploring this world. At the same time, they're doing so very playfully. Anderson recalls the recorders used on the album as the same plastic recorders that one would learn to play in school music class. Yeah, whatever, I mean, they were just things you bought in the, the local school supply shop, you know, yeah. little plasticky mm -hmm. thing. But then probably, you see, that, that wouldn't be so unlikely because that was what you did at school. That was almost, I think for, for many people, their first ever shot at playing a musical instrument was Just at school, recorder. picking up the, the school recorder and having a go. Mm -hmm. So I guess that, in a way, sort of it does 
it was likely to find its way into the the music of people like Led Zeppelin or Jethro Tull or, or Gentle Giant, for that matter. And uh, it is um, it's really quite a horrid instrument in a way, but it um, you know in the sense that it's a fiddly thing to play and doesn't quite have the strident but it's scream of the of the it's Irish a... tin whistle, you know. Yeah. As the album's title track. Aqualung deserves quite a bit of attention. The song brilliantly brings together the dichotomy of the different sounding songs on the album, all in one track. You have both the heavy, driving rock as well as softer acoustic sounds. The track begins with the iconic heavy riff. <laughs> Anderson's vocals follow the riff's melody as he describes the Aqualung character, sitting on a park bench, leering creepily at the schoolyard, while wiping the snot from his nose. Anderson co-wrote the song with his wife at the time, Jenny Anderson. The song's topic was inspired by a photograph she had taken of a homeless man. Fifty years later, Anderson looked back on the meaning of the song, saying... It was the humanity and the sadness, the vulnerability of this person that made me say, let's write a song about this character. Let's imagine who he is, whether he has a name, what does he do, where does he live? But more importantly, it's not just about him, it's about our reaction to the homeless, our feelings of compassion, of fear, of discomfort, of sometimes disdain. The character's name comes from the sound of his rattling breathing. In the lyrics, Anderson sings in the second verse, and you snatch your rattling last breaths with deep sea diver sounds. He's basically comparing the old man's voice to the sound of an aqualung, the name of one of the first scuba devices. Whether it's from cigarettes or the cold or illness, the sound of this character's labored breathing becomes the central image of the song and the album. What makes this song so brilliant is how the music parallels the conflicted treatment of Aqualung in the lyrics. The electrified, heavy sounds heard in the track match the dark, threatening side of the man. And yet there's a sense of sympathy for him too. About a minute into the song, the song switches drastically to an acoustic instrumentation as Anderson sings of the suffering of the homeless man on the cold London streets. The chorus lyrics are, Sun streaking cold, an old man wandering lonely, Taking time the only way he knows, Leg hurting bad as he bends to pick up a dog end. He goes down to the bog and warms his feet, Feeling alone, the army's up the road, Salvation a la mode and a cup of tea. Aqualung, my friend, don't you start away uneasy. You poor old sod, you see, it's only me. Immediately following this pulled-back acoustic chorus, Anderson breaks into an intense second verse, in which the electrified full-rock instrumentation works as a call and response with his vocal line, ending each phrase with an accented fill. Do you still remember the December's foggy freeze When the ice that clings on to your bed was screaming agony Hey, you snatch your rattling From that moment, the verse breaks into a frenzied runaway intensity. Jeffrey Hammond's bass takes a starring role in the second verse. This line drives everything forward so that the song continues into the second chorus. Even with its more sympathetic lyrics, the band is continuing its phenomenal groove. This groove culminates at Martin Barre's epic guitar solo, which Guitarist Magazine named in their top 20 guitar solos of all time. Barre recounts recording the solo just as Jimmy Page of Led Zeppelin walked into the studio. We'd locked ourselves away in the studio, us doing Aqualung and them working on Led Zeppelin 4, and I hadn't seen Jimmy Page at all. Finally, he walked into the control room to say hello, just as I was recording the solo to Aqualung. 
Now in those days, if you didn't get a guitar solo in one or two takes, it might become a flute solo. It was go in there and do it or else. And here was Jimmy waving like mad. Hey Martin, and I'm thinking, I can't wave back. I'm gonna blow the solo. What a great story. After Barre's solo, the song returns to an acoustic instrumentation. The song is remarkable for the way it constantly switches between two sonic worlds. In the same way that the lyrics negotiate disgust and sympathy for the Aqualung character. With all of these changes, the listener is never quite sure what to expect. The instrumentation and the texture is constantly changing, even on repeated sections like choruses. The only part that does stay the same is the iconic opening riff. Whenever it comes back, it has a hardness and an edge to it. Anderson had come up with the riff on an acoustic guitar while sitting in a hotel room in the United States on tour. He recalled, I suppose inspired in a little way by the drama of Beethoven's opening notes of the Fifth Symphony. You take a few notes and then you come in with some motif, which is powerful, and it establishes the whole nature of the song. It's a great trick when you can do it. Deep Purple did it with Smoke on the Water. Cream did it with Sunshine of Your Love. And when you come up with one of those simple, magnificent riffs, it's a great thing to own. It's a fine jewel in a musical firmament. Aqualung's riff opens the song and sets the level of intensity on high for the rest of the rock tracks on the album. Let's break it down. So what a great guitar riff this is. What I love about it is it has no perceptible key center because it starts off the riff in a G minor pentatonic like this. It's got that flat five going to the fourth, so it just sounds a little evil. It sounds a bit early Black Sabbath, doesn't it? Which is interesting because of course, Tony Iommi at one stage is rumored to have been offered the gig in Jethro Tull. I think that's before his accident with his fingertips. So it doesn't surprise me that there's a connection. And then the chord sequence is really great. Let's just play it through. What I love about this is on the chords, there's also a major third being added. And when I've played this on my own, I've played it like this. It's a little fiddly, but it works great. a really, really cool riff. Every single chord is a major chord, except you could argue that first riff is probably, you know, is a G minor pentatonic with a flat five. Great, simple, yet interesting part that seems to have no perceptible key center being all majors going up. Just really, really cool, really inventive. And Jethro Tull really with a perfect blend for me of a folk band and a prog rock band. It was like progressive folk rock. You had flute, you had acoustic instruments, and you had kind of evil sounding Black Sabbath style guitar all going on at once. Doesn't get much better than that. Aqualung was recorded in the new at the time, Island Studios in London. The building had been a church converted into a recording studio. And both Led Zeppelin and Jethro Tull were in a way the guinea pigs for their new studio being a, as I think I recall, a converted church, Basing Street. It had, by the standards of then, all the latest in technology and the latest in studio ideas. Unfortunately, many of them were wrong. <laughs> and the studio was really very, very difficult to work in. Both studios, both Studio One and Two, 
I think Zeppelin has maybe a slightly easier time. They were in a smaller studio, I think, downstairs, and we were in a very big room upstairs most of the time. So it was a very difficult album technically to make because we just didn't know what we were hearing. And it, it just, everything sounded bad in the room. Everything sounded jarring and unpleasant. And when it came to, to mastering the record, a lot of my confidence you know, had gone out of the out of the whole process. I mean, it really didn't sound to me a good album. It, it still sounds, in many ways to me, an album fraught with um, a lot of later modification in terms of trying to EQ the um, stereo masters for the cutting. John Burns, the engineer on the album, remembers the space a little bit more positively. He explained that he preferred the new island studio on Basing Street to Morgan Studio, where the band had recorded throughout 1969 and 1970. Morgan might have been the first to have a 24 track, but Island basically was much better with a much liver recording room. Morgan was acoustically a completely dead room, and also Morgan had a Kadak desk that was not particularly to my liking, whereas Basing Street, Island Studios, had a Helios desk, which was very engineer friendly. Ian didn't want to use any reverb on the Aqualung album and I had mixed clouds in there in Studio 2, and I loved the desk, and I liked the vibe at Island. And that might have been why we went there. Most of the album was recorded in Studio 1. In terms of the equipment used on the album, Burns recalls using either an AKG D20 or D25 on the bass drum, and a D20 or possibly Neumann U87 on the toms. He also remembers an AKG 224E on the snare, an AKG 451 on the hi-hat, and two Neumann U87s as overheads. For the amps, he says he likely would have had an AKG D25 on the bass, a D20 close up on the guitar, and probably a U87 about 40 centimeters away. The piano was likely recorded using two Neumann U87s, and vocals were probably recorded again using a U87. Burns also recalls a 3M 16-track tape machine and a couple of Studa 2 tracks. The studio also had EMT stereo echo plates and Uri 1176 compressors and four 15-inch Tannoy monitor reds in Lockwood cabinets for the monitors. Terry Ellis produced the album, as he did with their three previous albums. This was Stand Up and Benefit. He also was the co-founder of the Chrysalis record label, which Aqualung was released under. Aqualung was released on March 19th, 1971, where it peaked at number four in the UK album chart and number seven in the United States. Despite its enormous success as an album and containing some of the band's most iconic tracks like Aqualung, Locomotive Breath, the album only had one charting single, Hymn 43, which barely made it into the Billboard 100, peaking at number 91. The song Aqualung was never released as a single, and Locomotive Breath as a single didn't chart until nearly five years after the album's release. The album itself experienced quick and lasting success. A year after its release, The Village Voice ranked it at number 22 on its annual Jazz and Pop Critics Poll of the best albums of 1971. More recently, in 2013, Rolling Stone ranked it in a list of the 500 greatest albums of all time. 50 years later, its impressive legacy continues. It remains the band's best-selling album. It is a powerhouse record, holding its place as one of the most important and influential albums of all time. Thank you ever so much for watching. Please check out the other videos in the series. This has been wonderful. It is incredible to think that this album is now 50 years old and it is still getting incredible amounts of radio play and never ceases to amaze me just how good it is. So thank you ever so much for watching. Um, please leave any comments and questions below. So long, farewell, au revoir, adios, adio. Tschüss, goodbye, farewell.